Hey there everyone, so today I'm down here at Cary Furnace's National Historic Landmark and uh, we're working on the 48-inch uh, universal plate mill. So uh, recently, <clears throat> the, uh, our Youngstown Seal Heritage Foundation was contracted uh, with the uh, Rivers of Seal Heritage Corporation to manage the reassembly and restoration of this uh, rolling mill. Uh, which consists of the 48-inch uh, universal plate mill stand, there is a pinion stand, and then there is a two-cylinder stationary steam engine that drove it. So this video, uh, I'm just going to go over this equipment a little bit and show you what we have here and what this stuff is. Now, this plate mill was built in 1899, <laughs> by uh, Macintosh Hemp Hill, which was located all, if you know anything about Pittsburgh, if you know where uh, the south side is, between the south side and Station Square along the Monongahela is where their plant was at. <clears throat> uh, they built this universal plate mill for the U.S. Steel Homestead Works, which of course at the time was the Carnegie Steel Homestead Works. And what a, what a plate mill does, what a rolling mill does, is that it takes in larger pieces of steel that's been heated up uh, to 24, 2500 degrees or so, don't quote me on that, and then passes it between two big steel rolls and it squeezes it down to another shape. So everything that you see out there, mostly made out of metal or made out of steel, um, sheet metal, plates, angles, I-beams, rails, anything like that, went through the rolling mill process. So this mill here had had a um, large work roll that was down here and had another one that was up above it. And then the slabs would then come down, come in basically from where the wall is heading our direction and then pass through and then go back and forth several times, squeezing it down from whatever size it came in as down to whatever size they wanted it as. The universal part comes from the fact that there were also in these pockets vertical rolls that could then move in and out and also um, you know give you the exact dimension of plate that you wanted. So say you wanted something that was one inch thick and 36 inches wide. Well this mill could make it and make it exactly 36 inches. The normal plate mills uh, the edges would just be whatever they are then you'd have to trim the edges but this here was made so that you can make plate of a precise width um, because you know you look at this time period uh, 1899 1900 you know most of the constructions going on was you look at this building it's all angles and channel and plate and all riveted together well look at that plate up there that makes the uh, uh, the crane girder. Well, that is about, let's see, that's about 36 inches wide. So that plate would have been rolled and may, could have been rolled on this mill. Also, the columns. Well, you have a channel here, then there's four pieces of angle, and then there's a plate in there, and it's all riveted together. So those thin plates could have been made on this mill. And then you look at, well, you have this building, and then you have... Um, all the other mill buildings, plus you have other commercial structures and bridges and everything else that's being made in this time period. And, you know, this was pre the uh, um, invention of the gray wide flange beam mill at Bethlehem Steel. So if you wanted a beam that was 36 inches, you had to make it out of channel and plate. You couldn't just roll it out of a, out of a piece of steel. Um, that came in 1906. 1908 over at Bethlehem. So this was kind of the uh, state-of-the-art technology for the time. So in order to make the horizontal rolls turn, to make the vertical rolls turn, uh, you needed something to power it. So all that power came in off of this reversing steam engine, a 50-inch bore by 60-inch stroke, two-cylinder. Uh, this is a non-condensing and also non-compounded steam engine. This is just a simple reversing engine. So you had the 
power takeoff come off the end of the crankshaft here. There's the crankshaft in the background. It came in as one shaft. There were pinions in here, two big gears. Um, and the one is sitting behind the man lift there, right there. Those two pinions. And then there was another set of gears that was in here. And it's actually this thing right there was all in here. And then you had one power shaft coming in. Then you had two power shafts coming out. And then you also had two additional shafts going down through those bearings to drive the vertical rolls. And then you had the other two main shafts going into each one of the uh, work rolls. So came in as one shaft and exited as four. Um, and then you also had the ability to move those work rolls up and down and then move the um, vertical rolls back and forth. And so those were done with electric motors. And the electric motors for moving the vertical rolls in and out were actually up on top of the pinion stand. And, you know, all that stuff gets put on later. And then the one for moving the work rolls up and down uh, was a flat belt that was back along the wall on a, on a platform. Uh, of course, all that stuff will be put back in in due course as we're doing the restoration. So what do we basically have here? Uh, as you can see, it's just a lot of really big, heavy castings. Uh, most of this, uh, most of these are steel castings. Um, I think each one of these is like, oh, we're close to 100,000 pounds a piece. Um, I forget. It's been 10 years since we moved this stuff over here. Then you have uh, what they call mill shoes. So these things here, um, they call mill shoes, and they're embedded into the concrete foundation. And then everything on top can be picked up and moved off. You just have these T-bolts that fit in there and a nut and a washer. And then you can bolt this stuff down wherever you want. So you can move them back and forth on the, uh, on the mill shoes. Um, you know, you can put other things here. You can do whatever you want. It's, it made for a very, um, very nice way of handling this. Instead of everything being bolted down to the concrete, it bolted down to these, these slots. Okay, let's take a look down through the middle here. This is where all the uh, the shafting would have been. Um, and uh, all the gearing and all this in this area here. As we turn around, you can then look through and see the, uh, um, you know, in the bed plates for the steam engine where the main bearings were at. And that's one of the main bearings there. So... Um, <clears throat> what do we have to do to restore this? Well, <laughs> as you can see, there's not much of this that's together yet. Uh, we've started already with just, you know, wire wheel and chipping gun, um, just getting the castings clean and then putting a coat of uh, the rusty metal primer on there. And I think everything will get a coat of the primer as we're putting it together. And then once we get you know, a good bulk of this thing together, then we'll go and we'll apply the final coatings to get it to the right color. You know, one of the important things to do in a restoration is trying to make this look the right color uh, and the right appearance that it would have had when it was in service. So, you know, you don't want any like gaudy black or anything like that. It's gotta be, you know, like a grayish black and not everything's the same color. It's got a little nuance to it. So, uh, I hope that we can get the right surface finish on this thing when we're done so it looks as close as possible on something that's non-operating as something that would be operating. Um, the pinion stand historically was just all, grease all over it. So it's going to have the appearance of being shiny and greasy looking, um, which we might actually do with real grease or who knows what. We've yet to figure that out, but, you know, it's got to look a little different than the mill stand because of all the grease and everything that was uh, uh, involved here. Um, so let's take a little closer look at the, at the engine here. First off, let's look at the uh, crankshaft. Um, so the, the first thing you notice on the crankshaft is this should be a perfectly cylindrical bearing surface. And look at this. This I don't know what the heck happened, but right at the end of its life, this thing uh, 
lost lubrication, something happened to dig deep uh, grooves like that into it to the point where the babbit melted and fused itself so the we can't get this bearing off of that we're gonna have to heat it up melt the babbit out to get the bearing off same thing over here with this one you know it's not nearly as bad but you can see it's it's kind of wallowed out um the crank pin looks okay now okay you may look at this you know a little bit of steam engine and say that's a flywheel that's actually not a flywheel that's what Mac Kemp called a balance wheel so normally on a steam engine a big one like this you'd have a lot of weight on the other side of this of this crank you'd have a big piece of metal down there to counterbalance it the video that I have of the Todd engine my last video you could see that how they made it the traditional way what Mac Kemp did is instead of doing that they just cast this piece and you can see there's it's hollow up there but it's solid down here so down here they put that extra weight in there to balance out the crankshaft um, as far as i know this this is the only um, engine maker that did that and this is the only surviving example of a balance wheel um, so let's uh, let's take a little look over here uh, you got your eccentrics, and then there's the other main bearing, and then of course there is the the outboard uh, crank pin. And uh, so over here we have oh, very handy to have this little ladder here. So over here we have the two um, bed plates. Now. Of course, this is a lot different than the Todd. You know, the Todd has a big flywheel in the middle. There's a lot of space in between. Here, there's not much space. And also, you can see instead of having the board guides where the bed plate is completely around the cross head, this has like a more flat uh, cross, cross head in it. And also, the bed plates are cast in two halves. You have this half and that half, and then you have these oval shrink links in between. And then the other thing is that this piece here, which is sitting in a 90 degree angle, gets turned and fits between the two bed plates. And basically uh, with that and plus another cross piece up here makes this engine into one solid piece um, that's connected together with bolts and tie rods and all that. So it makes a much more rigid construction than uh, our Todd engine uh, um, and, and that's mainly because the Todd engine made about four to 5,000 horsepower, turning 75 RPM in one direction, and it ran a much smaller rolling mill. This thing uh, was just like a blooming mill engine. So you're at 10, 15,000 horsepower in one direction, and then, you know, a second later, you're going in the other direction, and you're reversing this thing. So this engine took a heck of a lot more abuse and produced a lot more power so it was built much heavier it's a nice thing that we were able to preserve well not we but it just so happened that the two rolling wheel steam engines that were preserved one of which is a you know a single direction flywheel reversing engine compound reversing engine and the other one is a um, is a reversing engine uh, with no flywheel so we get an example of both of the technologies and we can also look over here as we can see the uh the rest this vantage point for the rest of the mill stand so we will be working on this project for at least the next two years um, and i plan to create videos as we go along because we want to document how we're doing this because this is the this is the only time we're ever going to get of to <laughs> basically reassemble such a large piece of 19th century steel making technology these things simply just do not exist anywhere else um, you can see the overhead crane in the background that crane does not function all the copper was stripped out and then um, so we have a uh, hydraulic truck crane that we'll have in here for moving parts around and anything that that can't handle we'll have a bigger hydraulic crane come in to do that uh, so we'll be we'll be working with uh, <clears throat> modern equipment and not using the old crane there. 
Uh, our goal for this winter for the project mainly is to get this building in a little better condition for supporting the project. So, you know, we've got a lot of parts that were stored in here. Those are going to get moved outside uh, to clear up a way that we can get around the entire mill. Uh, we've also been working on uh, just cleaning up these castings and, and getting the dirt off and rust off and getting them primed. And then uh, we also have to pour concrete underneath all of this to get everything bedded down to the floor. So, you know, we've got to get that all designed and we can't really pour concrete in the middle of winter. So we're going to do that next spring. Once we get the concrete done, then we'll start putting some of the parts on. And by then we'll have things in a much better condition for working in here. And we'll have some of those parts already cleaned up because we'll prep them just like these two pieces right here. You know, we'll prep them, we'll set them aside. Then when it's time to go put those on, we'll bring that stuff in and just start putting it on the mill. So, yeah, so in addition to what I've been doing up in Youngstown with the Jane on Arrow Gauge and the other two locomotives and, and getting the, uh, uh, the site ready for the Narrow Gauge Convention next year, and I've also been working on our Todd engine and getting uh, some stuff done in that building, I also have this going on down here in Pittsburgh. So... <laughs> Uh, I'm going to be quite busy for the next couple of years, and um, but you know, I'm 50 years old. I feel I got a few more years of physical labor left in me, so I might as well go out with a bang and get some big stuff done here. <laughs> All right, everybody, uh, take care, and I'll talk with you soon.